Um, this is the Folio Sprint Review, and I'm Kate Borama. Um, we have the team slides in, as usual, and there are no um, new team members to introduce this time around. So we can jump straight to Jakob's milestone slides. Let me just scroll through. <clears throat> and Jakob was actually going to be on the road, so I'm not sure if he was able to dial in. Are you, are you on, Jakob? All right, sounds like Jakob is not able to dial in. So I will just give you the highlights. So for the Goldenrod Q2 release, you can find the full release timeline linked um, here. Uh, there's uh, many details on the various milestones up on the wiki. This is a summary and um, the next big milestone is highlighted here. Um, the 12th of June is the module release deadline for all modules. That's um, next Friday. Um, there's another milestone coming up um, that's not shown here. At the end of this week, the 5th of June, we are aiming for a code freeze um, for the release as well. Um, but you can see the details by following this link. And then the other thing Jakob wanted to point out was um, that we have some changes in how we are managing um, the Q2 release. Um, one of the big ones is the release spreadsheet that um, tracked um, versions and releases and assignees um, is moving into JIRA. And there is a really good write up here on the wiki describing the new release process. Um, and if you have any questions about that, um, you can um, ask on the releases channel and tag Alexi Petrenko, who's our release coordinator. And I believe that's really all there is to say. Um, we have, um, as always, each of the POs has um, documented the highlights from the past couple of sprints um, and slides here in writing. Um, but we're going to skip those and jump to the demos. And it looks like we are starting out with Thunderjet and Dennis is going to kick us off. If he's on. Are you there, Dennis? Looks like he's maybe not got audio yet. So maybe we'll skip Thunderjet and come back to them. Uh, let's see, who did we have next? Um, Firebird with Stephanie Buck kicking us off. Are you on, Steph? I'm here. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Kate. Um, we will be showing you QuickMark. Um, this will be the second time. And uh, we will be able to show uh, the end-to-end -end solution. Uh, so we'll be able to show uh, edits and uh, changes saved to SRS and reflected in the instance record, along with some improvements that we've made in the last few sprints. Mikita, are you ready? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so yeah, I'll uh, present uh, some improvements we made for uh, quick mark editor and uh, let's go to editor so the first one uh, is that we have uh, like a space uh, between uh, like indicator uh, for subfield and uh, its value pretty small change but seems it's uh, useful for users uh, another change for um, Subfields is that uh, we have expandable uh, input and uh, we can uh, insert as many text as we want and it will be displayed. Uh, so like an example, uh, we have uh, another one. Uh, another improvement is that uh, we changed um, display view of uh, 008 field and now it's an, uh, just a row, um, like to save uh, space for the screen. 
uh, and additionally we converted uh, 006 and 007 fields to uh, bytes view uh, the same like we have for 008 and uh, to compare with uh, 008, uh, 006 and uh, 007 uh, could be added. So yeah, you see bytes view and uh, let's create uh, 007 and uh, for 007 we can define a type of this field so let's just unspecify it and uh, for each type we display different forms and uh, define value uh, and uh, the last feature like the main one is that uh, the form can be, can be saved and just remove like, uh, unnecessary changes and uh, press save. So we can see that uh, record has been saved and uh, yeah, uh, we have a new um, field edit like 007. And uh, that's me from my side. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Makita. That's looking really slick. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Let's try Thunderjet again. Are you, do you have audio now, Dennis? Dennis, are you on mute? All right, I guess he's still having issues. So let's move then to Fully Jet. Uh, it looks like Alexi is up first. Yep, and I'll just mention real quickly, this is Anne-Marie. Um, so Alexi's gonna demo um, updating of instances and items. We're having a little issue with holdings right now. Um, so this is one of our big things for Q2 is to move from just create to being able to update as well. Um, we also have a little uh, mapping update for the preceding and succeeding titles. And then Maria is going to show a new UI piece, which is just getting underway of uh, being able to um, make modifications, basically kind of batch edits to incoming files of MARC records. So that's, that's what they're about to show. So, Alexi. Um, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, do you see it? Yes. Okay. So, um, we uh, add some new fun added some new functionality for data import process. And uh, now uh, it, data import process support uh, uh, update uh, mechanism for instances. Uh, and uh, also I want to mention that uh, we extend our mapping for instances and uh, now it also support uh, preceding succeeding titles. So uh, let's start with uh, update. In, uh, action for the time part. So I prepare uh, to uh, pr prepare two mark files. Uh, one mark uh, file uh, have uh, uh, information uh, about uh, instance. So we can uh, just upload it. Someone try and work with me. Um, test. And uh, we use uh, uh, um, job profile that contains three actions, create instance holding an item. So we can run this job profile. Uh, 
and check uh, results. So uh, this uh, record successfully imported. So we have a human readable ID in O1 tag, have field uh, 99 fields, and we have a, a state for this uh, record as actual state. Uh, let's try to open it in inventory. Yeah, so we have created uh, uh, instance with holding and related item. Uh, so let's um, update our uh, mark file with uh, new uh, human readable ID in O1 identifier and uh, try to upload uh, try to upload uh, updated mark file and for this import we uh, use a new job profile that uh, contains a match profile uh, and in this match profile, we try to find existing uh, uh, instance by human readable ID and match this value with all one field. Um, and in case if uh, we find uh, this uh, instance, we try to update uh, it. And the same for match uh, say, say match for item, but it should use a um, uh, barcode number. So let's run our job. Some magic. Okay. Uh, let's check results. Yeah, in uh, imported uh, file, uh, we uh, can see that it uh, contain a existing one uh, human readable ID for uh, instance and field 99 fields and have a st actual state uh, and one second and if we open previous one import uh, we can see that uh, the state for this record is uh, switched to old because uh, uh, after update, uh, this uh, record doesn't represent the actual state of uh, existing instance in mod inventory. Uh, so let's try to open uh, this record in mod inventory. Yeah, so we change uh, value in um, nodes. So it was not changed, now it uh, switched to changed. And uh, let's go to our item. Mm. Hmm. Something wrong with call number suffix, so I need to recheck it. Sorry, but yeah, it uh, should update uh, related uh, item uh, as well as uh, existing instance. Yeah, and uh, what about uh, preceding succeeding titles? So uh, we can uh, import our uh, mark file with uh, uh, default load or using our um, job profiles and in newly created uh, instances. So let's try to open one. Uh, 
Yeah, we can see that it contains a preceding titles and let's take a look for another one. Yeah, it also contains uh, titles in uh, instance. And also it uh, sub uh, put a ISSN value for uh, precedent, this precedent titles and here we can see imported succeeding titles for this instance. So uh, I believe that's it from my side. If you have any question, please ask. Thanks, Alexi. And we literally finished the update yesterday and I was testing this morning and Alexi was testing this morning. So welcome to the world of just in time. Um, and Maria. Uh, hello, everyone. Do you see my screen? Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate the basic layout for details section of field or mark record modifications. And let's create a new field mapping profile. And I'm going to select a mark bibliographic as folder record type. So we see that details section now contains a table for mark. Uh, modifications and it consists of uh, action columns that has a uh, drop down with the actions, some information about field, sub action column, data position, and two um, additional uh, columns for uh, manage managing table rows. So let's look at the first action is at action and for this uh, action we can fill in information about field indicators and subfield also we can fill in information about data that should be added and we have a drop down for sub action now it has uh, one option and functionality of this option will be implemented in the next iteration so now I'm going to add one more row by clicking on this plus sign. And we can see that the first column now contains two arrows up and down. So we can reorder our rows. So let's look at the next action, delete. It's probably the simplest action because it has information about uh, fields only. It should be deleted. Now I'm going to add one more row and let's look at the edit action. For edit action, we also have a drop down for sub action column and it has uh, own options like insert, remove, and replace. And if I pick insert sub action, then a position column has a drop down so we can choose uh, our data should be inserted before or after screen. If I pick remove, then I can fill in only data that should be removed from the fields. And if I pick replace, then uh, I can fill in data about um, like find some data and replace it with another one. And now let's look at the last action is move action. And for the move action, we also have sub action um, drop down with two options, new field and existing field. And it looks similar. It has four uh, text inputs in the data column. So we can fill in information about fields. And so, yeah, we can add new row, we can reorder rows, also we can delete rows and please note that we can't delete the initial row, uh, the trash can icon is disabled now and we continue working on this table and our next step is connecting this 
table to the server. So now user is not able to save these changes. And yeah, I think that's it for me. If you have any questions, please ask. Great. Thanks, Maria. This looks really powerful. Thank you. Very cool. Okay, so it sounds like Dennis is back with audio. Are you there, Dennis? You want to kick off for Thunderjet? Yes, thank you. I can hear you now. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to show actually a handful of things here today. Um, and it's Whenever we do these, I feel like I need to mention there's so much work that happens on the back end. That we're not necessarily demonstrating here, but through the front end, we're demonstrating. Obviously, most people will acknowledge that, but uh, worth mentioning. The first thing that we're going to show, I'm going to hand things over to Alexi, and he's going to show the ability to edit orders while they're in the open state. And this hasn't really been possible until now. Uh, some fields were editable, but we've unlocked other fields. Um, and basically, we needed to do some work on the back end to support editing certain fields, primarily the quantity, uh, but also price. So Alexi is going to show editing open orders, uh, so very important enhancement here, as well as the ability to move an order from the open status back to pending. Handful of reasons why you may want to do that. Uh, but also in doing that, we had to handle interactions with other apps like Inventory and the Finances app. So Alexi is going to show that uh, some of that workflow now implemented, which is very exciting. And then move on to uh, an update to the way users create items from the receiving area. And previously, we used a plugin for create item to, to allow users to create an item record while they were receiving. And that's been replaced in, in order to resolve some technical issues with that plugin, as well as just improve usability there uh, based on feedback that we've gotten from the community and uh, through a handful of testing. So uh, this is a much more streamlined approach to being able to create an item, a lot fewer clicks and a lot less that can go wrong. Uh, so, Alexi, I'll pass it over to him and he's going to dem demonstrate those two things. Mm, hello, guys. Hope you hear me and see my screen. Uh, so, uh, as Dennis mentioned, I'm going to show you editing open orders. I have a couple of them uh, here. We can select one from the list. Uh, and in case a uh, user forgot to assign a bill to or ship to addresses, he can go to open order and uh, like assign it. Basically, uh, that's one thing. Uh, since uh, this order has push order line with uh, uh, like physical resource, uh, with quantity uh, like four, uh, it should it's uh, been awaiting in two locations. But um, uh, user can actually edit it if something was changed. Uh, so uh, most fields are disabled, but quantity uh, could be edited, and the user can delete actual. Uh, location, so it's like to do for now. But since pieces were created uh, on the step of uh, order open, uh, we have uh, like this model window to with pieces created, and the user can observe uh, that pieces are created. Select uh, corresponding. Uh, uh, this location was deleted from push third line, so user can delete these pieces and uh, proceed with saving uh, push order line. Uh, that's for open order, but uh, we have uh, another feature. Uh, if a user uh, was wants uh, make this order pending, 
to edit more fields, he can uh, transfer that with a separate permission uh, to pending status again. Uh, so uh, push third line uh, is editable at all. Uh, he can still uh, reduce locations. Uh, nothing will be checked, but in case uh, he'll open uh, this order again. Uh, in case pieces uh, were created for uh, locations, for more locations than now, uh, he should uh, deserve what a piece should be dead. Uh, and then order should be opened. So that's for editing opened orders. Uh, another great feature is the receiving. Uh, so let's go to receive. We have uh, manually adding pieces here. And uh, uh, as Dennis mentioned, we replaced create item plugin to this checkbox. So we just create uh, user can create piece uh, within item. He just have to select any location he wants. Uh, he can qu quickly receive this, but I'll show you uh, what what's going on on uh, this long way. So item was created and uh, it's linked actually to to the piece. He can go to inventory. Uh, item is creating uh, in on order status. So let's switch back to the receiving. Uh, here I have a piece without item. So when we go to receive screen, uh, we have uh, our piece with item and uh, we have another piece I created before without item. Uh, and uh, it also could be created on the receive step. Uh, as well, we can uh, assign any barcode, call number. So let's click uh, receive. And we have like received two uh, pieces with uh, corresponding uh, data. Uh, that's it actually from my side. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alexi. So the next thing we're going to look at is uh, another set of things that we've been waiting for for, for a little while, uh, depending on who you are probably. But the first is the ability to use acquisition units with organization records. So you will see the acquisition unit in two places on an organization record. The important one is at the top where you're actually assigning an organization, sorry, assigning an acquisition unit to an organization. Andre is going to show us how we do that. And from that point, you have a similar protection of certain organization records uh, with that acquisition unit. You can also add acquisition units to an account. And that doesn't actually restrict editing or visibility of organization records at all. The intention is to use those uh, later on when we're importing information. So an example might be importing an invoice from that vendor uh, using the account number will be able to assign acquisition units to it for the appropriate acquisition units. So Andre's going to show that as well as uh, some important updates to transactions, um, which, which now includes a transaction type called pending payment. That's just going to help the system keep better track of um, values that have we have an invoice for and making sure that we're we're tracking the amount that is put aside for that invoice in our funds so we have a pending payment transaction that ultimately gets replaced by a payment um, when the invoice is paid so Andrew's going to show us those two things okay thank you Dennis hello I uh, believe you can see my screen. Yep. 
Um, so firstly, as Denise mentioned, I'm going to demonstrate the ability to assign acquisition units to organizations, records, accounts, uh, manage and filter them. So let's go to organizations. Uh, I prepared one. Let's find it. And uh, if we go to edit screen, we'll see new field named acquisition units and uh, from the drop down list we can see that uh, our user uh, belongs to acquisition units demo unit and we can assign it to our record and uh, one more we go to accounts and see the same field and can uh, assign acquisition units to organizations accounts and uh, let's save it so on the detail screen, we can see updates and accounts and uh, an organization. And uh, let's uh, reset our filters and check that uh, acquisition, acquisition units filter is working. Yep. Uh, the second feature, um, is uh, to introduce new transaction type. Uh, it's pending payment. Let's go to uh, invoices. Here we can see prepared invoice in open status uh, with uh, one invoice line. And uh, here we can see that uh, subtotal is uh, $25 and it's uh, fully covered by uh, demo fund. And uh, so to see that um, one transaction and pending payment is created. Uh, we need to approve this invoice. Wait for some time. Yes, anyways, so it was uh, approved successfully and uh, now we can uh, go to our fund to check the new transaction. So uh, we need to find our demo fund and go to the transaction for current budget. So we can see that uh, there are two transactions. One uh, was created uh, during uh, budget creation, it's allocation type and pending payment that uh, we created uh, some minutes ago. And type is uh, pending payment. Uh, so if we go to invoice line, back and uh, approve or paid our invoice, and go back uh, to transactions. So we see that uh, our transaction type was uh, successfully changed from pending payment to payment and our that says that our invoice is already paid. Uh, thank you, that's all I have for this demo. I think if you have any question, please ask. Great, thank you, that looks great. Thank you. Okay, so Vega is next on the list and Darcy was gonna say a few words first. Sure, so we're gonna demo some two smaller pieces of work, um, but I wanted to mention that we've been working extensively on automated patron blocks, which is a rather large feature. And so um, we're hoping to complete all the back end work this sprint that we're in now, as well as the finalize the front end work, but um, it's been taking a lot of time. There's not a whole lot to demo at this point. So we went with some smaller pieces to demo. Um, I also just wanted to mention that I, I really kind of applaud Vega for finding a couple pretty serious security issues um, and bringing that to everyone's attention. And the one that maybe people are most aware of is the fee fine actions issues that we were having. And so we're in the middle of designing a, re, a pretty big refactoring of that. Um, and with that, I'll pass it off. Um, I don't know if Alex, were you planning on going first? Yeah, sure. Okay. 
Can you see it? Yep. Yeah, so I just wanted to show you a few small changes we have made to password complexity requirements. Um, now, before this changes, passwords uh, containing keyboard sequences or uh, repeating characters were not allowed. Um, so these two requirements, they uh, have created a lot of confusion for the users and uh, they were dropped. So as you can see, uh, the only requirement this password breaks now is the absence of a special character. And um, also uh, before these changes, passwords were not allowed to have um, single white spaces. So now white spaces are allowed. And um, the only new requirement we have introduced is the rule that the password could not have uh, consecutive white space characters. So if I introduce another special character, as you can see, uh, this password now breaks the rule about consecutive white spaces. So if I remove those, this password becomes valid. Um, and that's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm actually really excited about that change. Those requirements were really strict before. Um, okay. Was um, Anna also going to present something from Vega? Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, I will demo changes made in check-in module. Uh, this is end session, automated uh, end session, and also um, was added uh, link to requested item. So let's go to requests and let's find the request with um, item with open request. Uh, here is the item I've prepared. So let's copy barcode. So item is checked in now. Let's go to action menu. And here we edit request details link which navigate us um, to details, request details of current item. Um, now we go back to check-in page and we should wait when session will add, end automatically. I have set up the period of inactivity to minimal value to one minute. In this way, if any events such as mouse clicks and so on will not occur during this inactivity period, then session will end and check it in items will be cleared from the page. Uh, if, for example, I will click somewhere on the page, I will not do this. The timer will be reset and will start going down from the beginning. In this way, session will not end if I am interacting with the page. So we will wait a little bit more. And here we go. Session was added, ended uh, automatically. I guess that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any question, please ask and I stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Anna. Okay, so core functional is up next and we had a lot of um, stories that came together the last uh, couple sprints. So a lot of things to demo from claim returned um, to marking items withdrawn to call number searching, declared lost, um, a lot of things. And actually we're doing pretty well on time. So I had told the guys that they needed to rush, but I think you can, you can take your time. <laughs> so we'll kick it off with Bogdan. Yeah, hi guys, let me share my screen. Yeah. Can you see what I'm sharing? I should share. Uh, Lost item policy. Yes, you can see it. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm going to show um, 
of a new feature is uh, about assigning lost item fees when an item is declared lost. Uh, yeah, the entire uh, the entire process is controlled by the lost item fee policy. Um, here we have charge amount for item section. Um, there are actually uh, two types of charge. It is actual cost. Um, it is not implemented for now, and uh, set cost is this uh, some fixed value that will be charged uh, from the pattern once. Um, he has uh, he has declared an item lost. Uh, there is also option to charge some lost item processing fee, but it is uh, not mandatory and uh, it can be disabled by choosing here no, or by uh, setting a zero value here. Okay, but uh, let's leave both uh, both fees just just to te to test changes. So now we uh, we need to um, check out an item, and then uh, declare it lost. Okay, let's go to the loan details page. Okay, declare lost. Confirm, and yeah, once we confirmed. Uh, we should have two uh, fees assigned. First of them, as you can see, it is lost item processing fee for um, 10 in some currency and lost item fee for 50 some currency. Yeah, that's basically it that I have to show for this feature. Thank you guys. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Bogdan. All right, next uh, I have Sergey. Thank you, Kate. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. I hope you can see it. We can. Okay, I'm gonna start from improvement in uh, behavior of item uh, with uh, status withdrawal and uh, this item, uh, item is here and uh, this uh, feature about uh, displaying or hiding some options in pane header drop down menu for iOS, this item with status withdrawn and as you can see the option mark is missing is shown here and uh, the option uh, create new request is absent and in other words we can create uh, a new request for uh, for the item the status withdrawn and if we go to uh, to the request application directly so i'm gonna copy the item record for it and go ahead to the request application and uh, if you try to create a request for this item and as you can see the uh, module window is appears and says that uh, the item status withdraw uh, the, this item has status withdrawn and cannot be requested uh, and in request and information segment you can see the message that no request types available for selected item. Uh, if we uh, go back to the inventory application and try to mark this item as missing, uh, after confirm, uh, clicking the confirm button in the uh, mo confirm module, you can see that uh, this item change this uh, change his um, status on missing and that's all about this uh, feature and uh, now we are going to the user user's application and 
uh, I'm going to show you a feature that prevent the user uh, from changing the due date and renewing on an item that uh, is claim returned. As you can see here, we have a loan on item with status claim returned. When I uh, uh, go to the loan details for this loan, you can see the renew button and change due date button are disabled. And uh, if I select uh, his uh, this loan, you can see the renew button and change due date button are disabled as well. And uh, in action menu, uh, there are no any renew or change your date option. Uh, uh, if we select uh, both of these uh, loans, on item, with, on item with status checked out and on item with status claim returned, you can see the renew button and change your date buttons. Button are available. And after renew, you can see the message in renewal status field that the item is not renewed because it is claim returned. And uh, the same situation if we click the change due date button, you can see the message in other details field after entering the uh, future date the save and, and close button now is available after clicking you can see the uh, only item with status checked out is successfully changed but uh, the due date changed failed for item because is claim re claim returned it is claim returned uh, that's all about this feature and finally uh, uh, there is a new option in inventory application. I'm going to clear it. Um, it's, uh, it. It's ability to search by call number normalized uh, option via holdings and items segment here and here. Uh, they works very similar. And uh, I do want to mention that at first there was uh, a just uh, a huge number of options for implementation of normalizing the search uh, after long and successful teamwork. Uh, first of all, uh, of Charlotte, Mark, Zach. Uh, sorry, guys, if I forgot to mention somebody, it was managed to reduced to a reasonable number of cases that needed to be covered and the main work of the back end was do, was done by Bardan Suprun thank you Bardan and now on front end work front end we have the ability to search among call numbers normalized uh, among call number fields using this uh, option and it doesn't matter uh, how we enter the value in this search field. Uh, it, it might be small or large letters. Uh, in addition to that, normalization doesn't consider non-alphanumeric non symbols and misses them. I prepared uh, the uh, instance record. Uh, with holding that uh, have that has a, a call number prefix, call number main value, and call number suffix. And uh, for example, if we try to search by call number prefix, uh, we can find this. Uh, uh, we can find these records and, for example, if I wanted to try to find these records by uh, entering the pa uh, part of the uh, call number prefix or call number main value, I see, for example, that with small letter, uh, maybe some, some spaces, some dashes, 
some parentheses and uh, uh, after searching uh, you can see that uh, it works and we can find uh, the records with uh, appropriate call numbers in web appropriate call number fields uh, that's all from my side thank you for your attention thanks sergey uh who did we have next um matt Connolly. hi everyone okay um so i've got uh just a couple of more uh tricks to show you with different item statuses here um first of all we've added the ability to check out missing items with a confirmation um, so I have here set up my checkout with a user already, and I've got an item here that's been marked missing. And if I go now to check that out, I get a little modal asking me if I'm sure I want to do that. And then I can confirm and we get our regular checkout. Um, shifting over now to claimed returned items. Uh, so I've got a, a user here who has three items checked out, actually four now with the missing one. Um, and uh, we've added here an option to bulk mark them claimed returned. This is basically similar to the, the way the change due date dialog works with uh, bulk selection. So at the moment, uh, it's disabled because we don't have any items checked off. And if we select an item just that's been claimed returned already, that's still uh, disabled. But then if I select others that are not with that status, then I'm able to get into the uh, claim return dialog here. And so I get a list of the items that will be claimed returned. And here I have to enter some additional information about why they're being marked claimed returned. Um, which we don't need to worry about at the moment. So then if I go in, um, it tells me that the items have been marked claimed returned. I can uh, see the details in the table there. Um, note that the uh, item that had been previously marked claimed returned has also been marked claimed returned here. Um, there's a little work left to be done to make that um, uh, throw up a, a, a message to the user explaining that that doesn't really make sense. Um, but for the time being, it's, it's being marked claimed returned along with the, all the others. And then I can come back here. I see that all of these now have been claimed returned. Um, and finally, with uh, claimed returned items, uh, we also now have the ability to check those back in. Um, which is sort of a strange thing to do. So in this case, I got a, a little message here telling me the item has been claimed returned. And so I have to resolve it one way or the other here. Either it's been found by the library or it's been returned by the patron. And I can choose whichever ones of those I want. Uh, there's a routing message, we don't have to worry about that. And um, so that's now been checked in. And so if I, uh, uh, if I go back to, oops, where to go? Right, so if I go back to my um, loan details page now for that item, as in the action table here, we've got the checked in um, status message and it indicates which resolution was chosen found by library. And so that's now recorded along with everything else. Um, and I think that's, that's it for my list today. Thank you, Matt, looks good. All right, Michal has some as well, I believe. Uh, yes, hi, 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 Kate, hi, everyone. Let me just make sure that my screen is on here. Uh, this. Here. 
Um, so my stories are very similar, um, kind of a continuation to what Matt was showing and Sergey. Um, the first one here is um, under check-in module, and uh, we added this ability to check in, um, withdraw items with the suppressed, um, which are marked as suppressed from discover. And in this case, when we try to check in item like that, we will be presented with this new check-in um, model, which will basically ask us if we want to continue or not. Uh, so this is one small change. Um, now, right in the inventory, going back to the claim return uh, items, we added this ability to search for instance records which have items um, marked as claim return attached to them. So if I click here, you can see that I'm able to see all those instances. And then when I choose one of them, some of the items will be um, marked as um, claim return. So this is this new ability to search. Um, and then when, when we open one of those items, um, some of the actions here will be hidden. So for example, mark as missing or creating new request will be not available for claim return items. And in, in a similar fashion, when we move to uh, requests module and try to create a new request for a uh, claim return item, we'll be presented with this new model, which will tell us that item, this, this item won't be able to, we won't be able to create, create a uh, request for this, uh, this item. Um, and with this additional message here that no request types available for a selected item. Uh, and then we also added a couple more, couple more small changes uh, also related to claim return um, items. And one of them is this little counter, which will, will be shown for under um, open loans, uh, which will basically show us how many claim return items are on the list. So this is one little change here. And then um, on the loan details screen for, for um, claim return items, we added this little menu here called resolved claim and you will be able to choose from one of those options right now uh, which is declare lost or mark 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 as missing this i believe will will be only visible for um claim return item right now and uh, that i think that's it from from me thank you thank you michael thanks guys that was a lot of work for sure um, okay, great. And lastly for the teams is Concord with Magda kicking us off. <clears throat> Hello everyone. Uh, we also did a lot of progress on all uh, main features that we de deliver in this quarter, which means we have a lot to show as well. Um, first, we start with uh, generating mark records on the fly. Uh, Ilya Borisenko will present it, uh, this work shortly. In addition to the fields that we demonstrated previously, we now uh, added support for 005 field, which is the date and time of latest transaction. We support several identifiers, publication date subjects, and we also generate um, a leader for each record. And the mark validation continued to pass. Um, the next big part we work uh, in the last two sprints was mapping profile and job profile. Uh, this work will be uh, demoed by um, Evgeny uh, Malcev. And what we did in the recent sprints, we have created default mapping and job profiles that will allow for export of inventory instances as they are stored in source record storage or generated on the fly. We also completed a significant part of the work that relates for setting up mapping and job profiles. We also started and we will continue to work on that in current sprint on saving and implementing or applying the uh, transformation uh, that will allow uh, the user to append uh, holdings and item data to existing uh, MarkBeep record. 
on top of all this work, uh, we don't uh, sacrifice um, the quality of the code we do. We test a lot and we test early so we can find all uh, find and address the problems quickly. Victor Soraka will provide a high level overview of the team approach to UI testing. Ilya, are you ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ilya Beresenka from Concord team. So let me share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'm going to present to you uh, functionality that uh, Concord team developed during last sprints. It uh, relates to uh, generating Mark B records on the fly and we added support for uh, several fields that uh, Magda mentioned. So I prepared some uh, two records uh, uh, that I'm going to use uh, for data experts. So let's look on them. This first, uh, it's semantic web primer. Uh, so you can see it contains three identifiers values. Uh, also it contains publication date and uh, one uh, subject. So the second uh, records with the three in the end. Let's look on it. It's American Journal of Medicine. Uh, this record contains all uh, supported identifier types, these six. Uh, so it will be in the generated mark um, record. Uh, also, it contains publication date as well and three subjects. Uh, so I also prepared the CSV file with UADs of these records. So let's uh, let's do expert. Let's choose the file. This one. Okay. Now the export process has been started. Yeah, and already finished. So let's download uh, MRC file and save it. Now I'm going to use mark edit tool uh, to validate and check the content of the generated file. Let's open it. So this one. Okay, now let's validate this file. Okay, and you can see that uh, uh, there are no errors. Uh, it's fine. Now let's look on each record. So you can see uh, field 005, it's uh, a date and time uh, of the latest transaction. So it contains part of uh, date and also part of the time. So these three fields, it's uh, identifier values. Uh, also, uh, you can see subject uh, field. So the second record also contain 005 field. Uh, it also is the date and time. Yeah, and also it contains six uh, values of uh, identifiers and uh, three subjects. Uh, also, you can see that uh, if you look on leader, uh, they are different. It's because they are yeah, regenerated and they contain uh, some additional information that were developed in last sprints. So I think it's the all from my side and uh, thank you for attention. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, Evgeny? Hi, everyone. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I would like to introduce updates in the data export model. So, 
Now we are on the setting page and the right job profiles and fields mapping profiles options on the second pane. Let's continue with field mapping profiles. We use a data import experience and simplified search and sort solution for our purpose and covered it by test using the unit test approach. So here is a list of created mapping profiles and default one. This list supports uh, sorting, pagination, and for example, if there are no items for some reasons, the special message will be rendered. Also here is a search UI, but it's not supported for now. Uh, let's create a new mapping profile. I click on the new button to go to the form. There are two sections, summary and transformations. This form supports interaction with accordions, uh, fields, validation, and of course, canceling and saving. What about saving? For now, the only summary fields are supported, but transformations are under development and will be able uh, for checking before the end of the current sprint. Let's fill uh, the required fields and create new profile. As you can see, the, the list of the items refreshed and the cloud is displayed. So it looks like everything works fine. Let's go to the job profiles. The job profiles pane looks very similar, but it displays information about the job profiles. And job profiles are used to combine uh, uh, TCP settings and mapping profiles settings. Let's create a new job profile. So this form uh, allow us to fill name, mapping profile and TCP IP settings. TCP IP settings are disabled for now. And what about saving? Uh, we have already merged changes for saving and they are, the, they are available uh, on the testing environment, but it is now under the redeployment. So uh, I will show it the next time. So that's all from my side, thanks. Thank you, Evgeny. Uh, uh, Victor, are you ready? Yeah, uh, let me share my screen. So, uh, as a part of this demo, I just wanted here to uh, present uh, the test uh, approach which we use on uh, data export UI side. Uh, just want to firstly mention that we write, of course, tests just to order, uh, verify our functionality and uh, decrease the further bugs in the future. And the UI part uh, of data export is covered by two projects. One of them is Track Data Transfer Components, which is uh, basically contains a bunch of reusable components which we then can use in data export. And this project uses a unit, true unit test approach uh, where we basically pick particular components, set up it and test its behaviors. And uh, we, on top of this approach, we, for the UI data export project, we use end-to-end uh, -end test like approach. I would say end-to-end -end test like because it's not a real end-to-end -end test uh, approach because we don't use the real backend for this one. But uh, this approach is pretty common on the Folio UI projects and used everywhere. And we found that uh, because of resource uh, consuming uh, stuff of this approach, it should not be used for everything. And that's why we have a combination of these approaches uh, in data export project. So not everything with this one. And it allows us to have a pretty good testability and the code coverage of, on our projects. So here we can see the coverage for both of them. And we also maintain other metrics which SonarQ provides us, such as bugs, vulnerabilities, 
code smells and code duplications and uh, try also to manage them as <laughs> as uh, good as we can you know so that's it from my side basically let me know if you have any questions thank you all right looking good concord great progress uh, so that wraps up our team demos and um, so we can turn it over now to Anton for the QA update. Hello everyone, can you see my screen? I suppose you do. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I just want to thank, uh, thank Victor for such a meticulous work. Um, in, in terms of testing. And uh, we're making a good progress, but I wish all our components would look like that uh, in a sonar cloud. But um, that being said, uh, my usual update on the sonar cloud data. So this is what we have for the core modules. So, <coughs> excuse me, pretty much status quo. Uh, no, not a lot of changes uh, for coverage, except Stripe's components uh, at the bottom, uh, creeping up to 80%, slowly but surely, guys are chipping away and just few, like half percentage point away from desired green color. So keep on, uh, keep on at it, um, well, you're almost there. So the quality dashboard link is on top. Uh, feel free to explore it um, on your own. It has been updated with the latest, uh, uh, after the latest two sprints. So just summarize shortly um, what happened, um, what happened in the past two sprints. We declared a, uh, we declared a war on old bugs and we uh, so everything we attempted to close everything that's more than 12 months old uh, we still have a few uh, quite a few to work there it's it's mostly on me working with the uh, core platform team making sure we don't uh, we didn't close something that's important there's a good good bunch but that being said, we reduced the bug count from 758 to 372. So basically half of the bugs that I was complaining about uh, was uh, old outdated, uh, outdated issues that we don't need to kind of worry about at the moment. So kind of creates a cleaner picture and creates a better focus for you guys and creates uh, uh, kind of gives us hope that bugs um, can be squashed and it's not some kind of endless games when they uh, multiply before you know before we kill the old ones so uh, that's uh, that's on bugs so now moving on to another change that we did and many of you kind of hear about accessibility testing. So we separated those defects into totally um, uh, independent categories. So on the dashboard, they've been tracked separately. And even though it's important, but it's as of right now, it's not a release blocking issue. So uh, we just track them separately. There are a couple of links on this slide. One is for product owners um, uh, to use uh, how to approach uh, accessibility testing. And the other one is linked to the, um, to the GitHub repo uh, with the, which has a dev primer documentation on accessibility testing. So I'm sure uh, through the dev leads, uh, and through product owners, accessibility testing will come up. So you'll have to figure out the approach on testing. Uh, uh, so there's all, always a challenge in with the old modules. Uh, they're probably easier uh, time that you'll have with the new modules. Uh, 
So, uh, but that's all I have on the accessibility uh, defects. Just be aware that there's separate uh, kind of category and then we'll manage it uh, kind of as a separate chunk of work or separate a part of acceptance criteria that uh, you'll have to develop and define how you're gonna go after that. Now, uh, on to API integration tests. Uh, few good things happen. Uh, so, uh, Karate Framework uh, Pilot is complete. And you here's the link to the uh, GitHub repo that has documentation on how to, uh, how to create API integration tests with, uh, by, uh, by using Karate Framework. And on top of it, there was a, um, so the DevOps work has been done and we have now uh, a CI pipeline that runs uh, all the tests that are committed to this, um, the above uh, repo, folio integration tests. So if you develop tests and commit them to, the, to that repo, they will be ran on a daily basis uh, in the uh, automation section of Jenkins and the job called folio integration. So for any um, additional uh, help, or uh, questions, you can uh, contact Vasily uh, or Evgeny and uh, they will help you out to get started if you are looking to build out your API integration tests. So um, in addition, we do have uh, some teams develop large number of Postman tests and we are planning to create kind of twin pipeline, similar pipeline that will execute Postman tests. And uh, in, the long, in the long term, uh, we kind of encourage you guys, uh, again, pri uh, prior, uh, based on backlog priority and time and everything else, but we encourage you to migrate your Postman tests to uh, Karate tests. But again, uh, all uh, it's just balancing all the uh, feature work and all the other work that needs to be done. And uh, so the next item. So you heard a lot about probably from your team leads about schema updates testing. So to enable that work, um, we created vagrant boxes that you can use now to test your schema updates. So it was, we're looking for better ways to do that, but that's initial step. So it's kind of stop gap or how can we, can, what can we do to enable it um, quickly, uh, at least to do some testing. So two uh, vagrant boxes that are built on the, uh, Flame Flower uh, plus hot fixes release as a baseline. So that's your starting point from schema migrations. And then you can use that vagrant box to run your schema updates and see, see if they work and trash it and uh, bring the new vagrant box up and retest it when you need it. So there's a, a release core. So it's just the core modules or there's a full release uh, a Vagrant Box available. So full, feel free to use them for your um, schema update testing. And the last thing I have is, um, well, as you all know, there was a lot of requests for development uh, integration uh, uh, environments and that work had started. And we are planning to uh, that each development team will have isolated folio into uh, folio system, and it will be deployed within Rancher infrastructure. So Rancher is a kind of um, add-on that manages um, uh, containers, Kubernetes containers. So each team will have its own. Um, uh, 
its own project is and within that project you will be able to manage your own system without stepping on other people uh, other teams systems so you'll be able to deploy your folio or uh, just uh, dump it and redeploy it and do uh, uh, deploy modules from branches and uh, run the, uh, create the pipelines that would run test um, uh, run your integration test even prior to commi uh, committing to master so the uh, epic that tracks that work is folio 2601 if anyone interested and the team is consists of um, uh, so uh, several entities uh, uh, dedicated resources to um, uh, to this project so uh, index data it's uh, john uh, john malconian uh, Tamil, uh, Jason Root from Tamil and EPAM is uh, Stanislav Mirosnichenko. We are hoping to get it in your hands by sometime in July, most likely uh, end of July, but maybe a pilot team will have it sooner. So, but that's uh, kind of what we're aiming for. So hopefully soon, uh, right after the smoke clears for Q2 release, you will have your integration systems that you'll be able to work with. So that's all I have for now. Are there any questions? All right, I guess All no right. questions, Anton, but that's really good stuff. Some important changes coming up. Cool. Well, we have seven more minutes. Is there anything else anyone would like to discuss while we're all here? All right, um, I guess we will end a few minutes early. Um, as always, the, um, the recording will go up on YouTube. There'll be a link to the deck as well. So if you want to see the details of what the teams have been working on, including the things they didn't demo and what they've planned for next couple of sprints, you can check that out in the deck. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.